Good morning. I too want to welcome you here. We're very grateful for your, pers your presence in person and for those of you who are part of our online family. I trust that there is a word for each of you this morning from this text and from this message, and I invite you to receive that message, whatever that message is this morning. Kendra is a particularly talented person. She is, there we go, yeah. She is good at a, a wide variety of tasks and projects. And one of the reasons why she is particularly good is her willingness to ask for help. When she launches into a new task or a new project, she will watch several videos of people who have done that task or that project. She'll research online how to do it. She'll read several articles how to do that project. And I'm not so much that way. And so when it, when it comes to a new task or a new project, I'll, I'll often assume that I know enough to at least get going in this project. And very quickly, I will exhaust my very limited knowledge and experience, and I'll end up making a mess of something, and then I'll go ask Kendra for help. And so the question is, how self-sufficient are you? How willing are you to ask for help, to rely on the resources of others? It's a question that's raised by our text this morning. Kendra and I watch a number of home improvement shows. On any number of those shows, there's a buyer who sees this rundown property and they want to bring it back to its original luster or to some new level of luster. So they, they hire the hosts of the show and they ask them to do all this work. So the, the hosts walk them through the house and then the, the hosts show them what's going to have to happen here and how much that's going to cost and what will have to happen here and how much that's going to cost. And they come to some kind of of agreement and the renovations begin. And inevitably, the, the hosts of the show have to call the buyers of the property midway through the renovations because they've, they've found something unexpected. You know, they, they tore down the sheetrock, they dug out the plumbing, they did an investigation of the foundation, and, and there was something they didn't expect. And, and inevitably, that something is bad, and, and that something is the result of a shortcut that the original home builder took, trying to do something fast and easy rather than the right way, and now it's going to be thousands of dollars more and months of time more to correct that shortcut. How about you? What kind of shortcuts do you take? Shortcuts are, are really all the rage this time of year. At the beginning of the year, what we want is shortcuts. No one wants to hear an advertisement at the beginning of the year that says, Happy New Year, join our gym, and if you work out five to seven days a week all year, you might lose 10 pounds. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. What we want are the ads that say, Happy New Year, join our gym, pay the elite price, and in 30 days, you'll be at your summer ideal weight. We love shortcuts, but they're not always all that they are cracked up to be. It's a question asked by our text this morning. There was an online clip that went viral over the holidays. Maybe you saw it. You're looking at a huge church sanctuary, the kind of sanctuary that could hold two or 3,000 people. And there's a handful of people there rehearsing, obviously, for an upcoming Christmas presentation. And as, as you pan across the sanctuary, you hear these drummers drumming, these drummers drumming, and then, and then you look up and you see suspended from the enormous ceiling of this enormous sanctuary 
drummers with their drums drumming and, and they're moving back and forth in a choreographed way, suspended from the ceiling, all part of this massive Christmas show that's going to take place. And, and that scene was critiqued and panned online over the holidays as, as just a, another example of the, the sensationalism and the superficiality of the American evangelical church. What about you? In what ways do you rely? On the sensational, on the superficial? It is a question asked by our text this morning. So here we are at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, and Luke tells us that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit, led out into the wilderness, and there Jesus has an encounter with the devil three times. The devil tempts Jesus three times. The devil tests Jesus. And these three tests or these three temptations revolve around these three issues, self-sufficiency, shortcuts, and sensationalism. So let's just walk back through them. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. The devil is testing Jesus, asking Jesus, to provide for himself, to turn this stone into bread, which Jesus certainly can do. Jesus can provide this bread for his hunger. But Jesus refuses to do so. And his refusal has something to do with his fasting. Fasting in the text is not a weight loss program. Fasting in this text is a self-sufficiency loss program. In this text, fasting is a way of saying, I will forgo what I can provide, like bread, and instead rely on what only God can provide. Fasting in the wilderness was Jesus' way of acknowledging that there are provisions he can make for himself. He can turn this stone into bread. But what he really needs are the provisions he cannot provide for himself. What only God can provide. And so Jesus refuses. And in doing so, Jesus is showing that lowering, lowering self-sufficiency is a vital part of living in the kingdom of God. Sandra McCracken writes about this. There's a call button above every seat on commercial airplanes. In all my travels, I don't think I've ever used it. I'm not sure if that is due to shyness or to pride, as there have certainly been times when I acutely needed help while seated. While traveling recently, for example, I endured some delays and was thirsty, yet I waited to ask for anything until the plane reached 10,000 feet when the flight attendants came row by row to grant our drink requests. I didn't press the call button. Jesus, she writes, invites us to hit the call button. The test here in the wilderness is for Jesus not to use the call button, to provide what he can on his own. And in response, Jesus hits the call button. Ian Corbin, Harvard Medical School, works with stroke patients. And over the years, he has found that many stroke patients become very disconnected from others, isolated from others. Why? He says it's often because stroke patients feel ashamed. They're embarrassed by how weak they become, how vulnerable they become, how needy they are for the help of others in virtually every part of their life. And, and so many of them tend to isolate themselves, to cut themselves off from others. But Corbin writes this, the better healing would be to teach stroke patients, to teach ourselves that interdependence is nothing to be ashamed of. It's our birthright and the source of some of our deepest 
strength. Here at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, in essence, Jesus is saying the same thing. The better healing for all of us is interdependence, to lower our self-sufficiency and to rely on provisions that are not our own. So what would it look like at the beginning of this new year to practice less self-sufficiency? Well, for some of us, it just might look like asking others for help, whether it's people or organizations. Some of us, because of the way that we were raised or because of deeply held beliefs that we formed, whether they're spiritual beliefs or cultural beliefs or even political beliefs, we don't feel like it's appropriate for us to hit the call button to ask for help, to seek resources that only other people can provide. And yet, as Kristen reminded us, our time at the table is all about our interdependence. And so perhaps for some of us, 2023 is a year to ask for help. Being less self-sufficient might look like increasing your connections with others, Last Sunday, we talked about how many of us have learned loneliness over COVID. We've learned to be isolated and disconnected from others. Becoming less self-sufficient for some of us just means re-engaging socially, reconnecting with people and recognizing that, that we need something from relationships that we can't really provide on our own. And being less self-sufficient For some of us, just might mean improving our prayer lives. Some of us struggle with prayer. I acknowledged my own struggle in a a recent article in Embrace. We're not always sure that prayer is working. We're not always sure that we're doing it right. But, But at its heart, prayer is just fundamentally acknowledging that there are some resources, divine resources, that can be ours through prayer. And so for some of us, living out this first test or temptation might mean this is the year that we've, we become more serious about prayer. And I'm using the front page of Embrace right now to provide some practical steps toward reengaging prayer. In a few Sundays, we're going to take an entire 11 a.m. worship service, and we're just going to spend that time in prayer practices together, reengaging in prayer. Second test or temptation, verse 6, And the devil said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to you, anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil is presumably offering Jesus what Jesus has come to earth to receive all the kingdoms of the world. And presumably, the devil is offering a quicker, cleaner, less messy, more convenient way to achieve what he's come to earth to achieve. Jesus, why would you take, who who knows how long this is going to take, all these years to teach and to preach and, and to do ministry? Why go through the headaches of having to deal with all these people out there who you know are not going to be on the same page as you are. And of course, Jesus knows this at the beginning of his ministry. He also knows about the cross waiting for him at the end of that ministry. Why go through the pain and the agony of that cross when there seems to be this quicker, cleaner, less messy, more convenient way of achieving this very good purpose, receiving all the kingdoms of the world. And yet Jesus refuses. And in so doing, Jesus is showing that shortcuts are not part of life in the kingdom of God. We live in a world where quicker is almost always viewed as better. 
And yet for Jesus, life in the kingdom of God is about doing things with a slow work of God in mind that quicker is not always better. And that shortcuts often literally involve making a deal with the devil. Heidi Newman is a writer. She was a student at Brown University. And she took a year off from college to work for an organization here in the United States that provides services to people who live in rural parts of the country. She was assigned John's Island off the Carolina coast. And she was asked to interview and record these interviews with sons and daughters of parents who were once enslaved by the local plantations. So one of those sons and daughters was Miss Ellie. Miss Ellie lived at the end of a long dirt road in a single room wooden house. She was between 90 and 100 years old. No one really knew exactly how old she was. And Miss Ellie would, once a week or so, walk several miles to a good friend's house. The friend was named Netta. In order to make that journey to Netta's house, Miss Ellie had to walk through the tall, sweet grass, which was a hiding place for lots of poisonous snakes and, and other obstacles. Heidi, the college student, sent to interview Miss Ellie, learned of this, and, and, and she, she felt so sorry that Miss Ellie had to walk this distance once a week just to get to her friend's house. Now, the actual distance between the two houses wasn't that far. It's just that there was a, a fairly big stream separating the two houses in the midst of all this sweet grass, and Miss Ellie had to walk several miles to get to the point where the stream was narrow enough that she could cross and then finally make her way back to Netta's. So Heidi had an idea, and unbeknownst to Miss Ellie, she conspired with a group of people to help build a bridge between the two houses at the wide part of that stream. It only took a day for them to put this all together, again, unbeknownst to Miss Ellie. And when the bridge was Finished, Heidi went to Miss Ellie and she said, I want to show you something. Look, we, we built a bridge. We built a, a shortcut to Miss Netta's house. And Miss Nellie saw the bridge and she just shook her head. And she said, child, I don't need a shortcut to Miss Netta's house. And then she began to explain to Heidi all the other people that she would stop in with and visit all the other people that she would check in on, on that travel, all the goods that she would deliver to people along the way every time she walked to Netta's house. Child, she said, you can't have shortcuts and friendships in life. Shortcuts, she said, don't mix with love. And in a way, that's one of the primary messages that Jesus is, is laying before us here at the beginning of his public ministry shortcuts don't mix with love. Shortcuts don't mix with the way of God in the world. And truly there are often quicker, cleaner, less messy, more convenient ways of doing even some of the very good things that God has called us to do. But inevitably, those, those shortcuts mean making a deal with the devil. And then the third test, then the devil led him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him and he said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. It feels like here the devil is, is now just simply trying to distract Jesus. 
with sensationalism and superficiality. Look, Jesus, you and I know it'd be really helpful if you could just draw a big crowd. The best way to draw a big crowd is is to do something big and sensational, like a death-defying leap off a tall building. And Jesus refuses. And in so doing, he's inviting us to see that sensationalism and superficiality are really not part of life in the kingdom of God. And this is a particularly keen temptation for the church in America. Because we live in a culture in which what is bold and bright and loud and flashy is almost always determined to be successful. And what is not is almost always determined to be a failure. And yet again and again, as Jesus described what life in the kingdom of God is like, he uses images that are the very opposite of sensational and superficial. One of his favorite images is the image of the mustard seed. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that everyone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. It's the small, unassuming, unflashy mustard seed that describes what life is like in the kingdom. And I hope that you can hear all of this as really, really good news. It's easy to come to a text like this that's, that's out there in the wilderness, and there's fasting involved. I mean, who likes fasting? And now we're, we're confronted with the devil, and the text can feel a little hard, a little heavy. We may not be sure what to do with a text like this. But ultimately, here at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, what we're getting are three really great pieces of good news. Jesus is saying that life in Jesus' kingdom is about interdependence. It's about asking for help. It's about relying on resources we could never come up with on our own. Life in the kingdom of God is not Jesus just slapping you on the back and say, there you go, good luck. It's about relying on others. It's about doing things together. It's about having access the things that we don't have on our own. What great news that is. Life in Jesus' kingdom is about having the freedom and the luxury to take the long way, the right way, and not having to rush to do what really matters in life. What a healing way of life Jesus is giving us. And life in Jesus' kingdom is about trusting in the small and seemingly insignificant things, which is the stuff, after all, that makes up most of ordinary life for us all. And so as we close, I just invite you in this moment to consider which part of this really good news God is inviting you to live into this week. 